the report author, Matt Parr. Um, good to talk to you today. Uh, the independent report last summer did conclude that the Met was institutionally racist and that the Met had put up a huge number of barriers to their report. Why did you not find it to be institutionally corrupt? Uh, well, good afternoon. Um, we found an awful lot wrong with it, let's be clear, and there's uh, huge areas of agreement between us and the panel. Uh, and as you said in your introduction, the, uh, the Met's got an awful lot to do to get its anti-corruption practices to where they should be. I think where the slight difference was, and bearing in mind we had different remits, uh, is we simply didn't see evidence that the mistakes the Met had made uh, were dishonest or were sort of coordinated uh, in a campaign to frustrate the, the, the panel's... Uh, work. Um, we saw lots of things that went wrong and there are lots of things we criticise the Met for, uh, but I think without that element of deliberate dishonesty, uh, it's not a phrase that we'd use to call them institutionally corrupt. Uh, that doesn't mean there isn't an awful lot wrong and it's a very critical report. Well, indeed, and, and let's look at some of those, those things that are wrong. Uh, the Met's employing criminals, it's employing people who've committed crimes. Why does the police force do this? Uh, well, I think every case should be judged on its merits. There might be occasions where uh, someone who's had some sort of transgression a few years beforehand, uh, relatively minor, should be allowed to become a police officer. Uh, we do think that the Met's tolerance for things like that and their risk appetite, as they call it, uh, is too high. Uh, but where we're more concerned is if you are going to take somebody like that in, and there might be reasons to do so, um, it's a higher risk and therefore you ought to monitor it carefully and they ought to supervise it more carefully. Uh, and there's not enough evidence of that going on. Uh, uh, and, and in fact, all sorts of degrees of supervision of people who have uh, associations with criminals or have got a chequered past uh, are nowhere near they ought to be. I mean, why is this happening? That, that, that these people are not then being monitored once they're into the force? Uh, I mean, uh, like you, I sort of look at it and wonder how on earth, uh, after 35 years of criticism over uh, Daniel Morgan, the way they handled the initial investigation, the subsequent investigations, the failures in court, uh, in which police corruption was a very major factor, uh, we find it uh, bewildering uh, that no one seems to have said this is something that we can't put up with, we've got to get it right, uh, we've got to be absolutely sure over this. Now, doing all the things that we've recommended, we've recommended 20 uh, areas for improvement, uh, doing all those things doesn't guarantee that you never get any corruption in a force, but I think it's the minimum that the public would expect is that the Met should be doing all it can to minimise that, and at the moment it just isn't. So, you know, essentially, it almost seems that what you're finding is that there isn't sort of an institutional conspiracy to be corrupt, but, but there is corruption just by, by the fault of almost indifference. Uh, indifference is a word we use in the report. It's what it looks like to us. Uh, I'm sure the Met will say differently, but uh, there were low standards in the way they looked after property, which, again, was a... Uh, feature with the exhibits of the Daniel Morgan case. There were poor standards in the way they supervise people. Some of their policies are not in accordance with what the national guidance says. Uh, and there were just, you know, people not doing the right things to minimise the risk of corruption almost across the board. Now, there were some pockets of real excellence. So one of the things we congratulate the Met for is that they had a big vetting, vetting backlog. They had 16,000 people unvetted uh, three or four years ago, and they've, they've pretty much eradicated that. And the real high-profile, uh, serious cases, they investigate those really well. Uh, but it's all the other things that they ought to do uh, to, to make sure the wrong people don't join the Met, uh, and if they do, to make sure that they're found out and they can't get away with corrupt behaviour. It's all those little things that they ought to be doing uh, that, 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 on their own, don't look as important, but in sum, uh, they present a picture for us of a force that doesn't really take it as seriously as it, as it should, especially after what's gone wrong in, in the Daniel Morgan case. Indeed. What do you think it says about an organisation that they're not keeping track of, of warrant cards and ha has access codes for security things etched on doors? Yeah, I mean, it says something about the culture of the organisation, doesn't it? I mean, we've, we've all seen these dreadful uh, cases where misogyny, sexism, racism has has blackened the Met's reputation. Uh, but I think, you know, as an organisation, you look at culture wider than that. It's, it's how people behave when no-one's looking. It's surely the first person to see that there's this security breach should pick it up and correct it. Uh, surely it's everybody should know that if there's somebody who's got a, 
uh, a declarable association with somebody you know, who, who happens to be related to someone who's an active criminal, um, that should be supervised and people should be aware. Uh, and they're just not. So I think it speaks of an organisation that hasn't really got a grip uh, on this particularly important part uh, of police culture and practice. Very interesting to talk to you. Thanks very much for joining us there. Matt Parr, HMA Inspector of Constabulary, has carried out this report into the Daniel Morgan case.